Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. If you enjoy listening to horror stories, and this is your first time on this channel, consider subscribing as I upload brand new horror stories every single evening. Please leave a like before we get started. Thank you. Growing up in Atlanta, I always felt like the odd one out. While all my friends were constantly talking about their crushes and their boyfriends, I was busy burying my nose in books and focusing on my studies. Don't get me wrong, I had crushes too, but they never seemed to reciprocate my feelings, or they would just leave me feeling rejected and alone whenever I tried to reach out to them. As the years went by, my lack of romantic experiences became a source of embarrassment for me. I would make up stories about boys I had dated, or make excuses for why I was still single. Deep down, I knew the truth. I never had had a boyfriend. At 25 years old, I was still living with my parents and working a mundane job at a local grocery store. My life was boring lonely, and downright annoying. I longed for excitement and adventure, but I didn't know where to find it. One day, out of sheer boredom, I downloaded Tinder, the infamous dating app. I'd heard so many stories about people finding love on there, and I figured I had nothing to lose. I started swiping left and right, matching with guys who seemed interesting enough. I went on a few dates, but they were all the same. Awkward small talk, forced laughter. I quickly realized that I wasn't looking for a serious relationship. I just wanted fun, excitement, and a distraction from my shit life. That's when I started going on dates just for the sake of it. I didn't care if I liked the guy or not. I just wanted something to do. I became a pro at making conversation and getting off the illusion that I was interested in these guys, when in reality, I couldn't care less. But then, I met him, Adam. He was charming, funny, and had a way of making me feel like I was the most important person in the room. We went on a few dates, and I found myself actually enjoying his company. He was different from the other guys I had been seeing, and I started to develop feelings for him. One night, after a particularly romantic date, I invited Adam back to my parents' house. I know, it sounds crazy, but I didn't want to be alone, and I didn't want the night to end. We snuck through the back door and made our way to my room, trying not to wake anyone in the house. But as soon as we settled in, my dad burst into my room, anger all over his face. I had never seen him so mad before. He started yelling and cussing at Adam, telling him to get out and never come back. I was frozen in shock, not knowing what to do. Adam, being hot-headed, started yelling back at my dad. Before I knew it, there was a full-blown fight, punches being thrown, insults being thrown. I couldn't believe what was happening, and this was all my fault. My mum came rushing in, trying to break up the fight, but it was too late. The damage had been done. I was scared and embarrassed. I had brought a guy to my parents' house, and it all ended in disaster. Adam stormed out with blood coming out of his nose, leaving me alone with my parents, who were both fuming with anger. My dad yelled at me, telling me I was irresponsible and that I should be ashamed of myself. My mum just shook her head, disappointment written all over her face. I couldn't take it anymore. I ran out the room, crying my head off. I felt like such a failure. I was so embarrassed. I'd ruined everything. My parents' trust, my chances with Adam, and worst of all, I'd lost myself in the process. 
The next few days were just an absolute nightmare. I avoided my parents as much as possible, staying in my room and drowning in self-pity. But eventually, I had to face the consequences. My dad sat me down and had a long talk with me. He told me how disappointed he was, but also how worried he was about me. He could see that I was lost and searching for something in all the wrong places. He reminded me of my worth and that I didn't need a boyfriend to be happy. It was like a wake-up call for me. I realized that I had been using guys as a distraction from my own unhappiness and insecurities. I had been so caught up in trying to fit in and being like everyone else that I would lost sight of who I truly was. I apologized to my parents and promised to make things right. As for Adam, I reached out to him and apologized for my behavior. He forgave me and we started dating for real this time, but he refused to come anywhere near my parents or the house. More importantly, I started to work on myself more and my own happiness. Looking back on that night, I realized how dangerous things could have got. I could have put myself in even more danger, all because I was bored and looking for something to fill the void in my life. It was a scary wake-up call, but it was also a lesson learned. Now, I'm happy and content with my life. I don't need a boyfriend to define me or make me feel whole. I am my own person, and that is enough. I always thought it was for a desperate individual, those who couldn't find a date in real life. But after my friends convinced me to try it out, yep, that's right, I got onto Tinder. That's when I came across a dude named Jack. His profile picture showed a pretty handsome, rugged man with a charming smile. His bio said that he was a freelance photographer, enjoyed travel, and had two puppies, which immediately caught my attention. I've always been a sucker for adventurous types, and if those adventurous types have puppies, sign me up. We started chatting and hit it off right away. Our conversations were easy and filled with laughter. We discovered that we had quite a lot in common, from our taste in music to our love for trying new foods. We even made plans to meet up for dinner at a diner in the city. As I got ready for our date, I couldn't help but feel a sense of excitement and nervousness. I had never met someone from Tinder before, and I wasn't sure what to expect, but I pushed those thoughts aside and focused on looking my best. I arrived at the diner a few minutes early and nervously checked my phone for any updates from Jack. He had texted me saying he was running a bit late, but would still be there soon. I decided to take this opportunity to freshen up in the bathroom. I left my phone on the table and headed to the restroom. As I washed my hands, I couldn't help but feel a sense of relief. This was going to be a great date. I just knew it. However, when I returned to the table, my phone was nowhere to be found. I searched my pockets and my bag, but it was gone. Panic started to rise in my chest as I realized that someone must have taken it while I was in the bathroom. I quickly asked a waiter if anyone had come by the table while I was gone, and he mentioned a man who asked to use the restroom. My heart sank as I realized that it was most likely Jack that had taken my phone. I frantically looked around the diner, hoping to catch a glimpse of him, but he was nowhere to be seen. I couldn't believe that someone I connected with on Tinder would do something like this. I tried calling my phone using a stranger's, 
but it went straight to voicemail. I knew that Jack had probably turned it off to avoid being tracked or called. I felt so stupid and naive for trusting someone I barely knew. Looking over the CCTV at the restaurant, sure enough, yep, it was Jack. It looked exactly like him, and I couldn't believe it. Tears started to well up in my eyes as I thought about all the personal information and memories stored on that phone. How could someone be so heartless and steal from another person? Feeling defeated, I left the diner and headed home. I reported the incident to the police and changed all my passwords and cancelled my credit cards just in case. But nothing could replace the feeling of betrayal that I felt. Days turned into weeks and I still hadn't heard anything from the police or Jack. I'd given up hope of ever getting my phone back. But then, out of the blue, I received a message on Tinder from Jack after logging into it with my new phone that I bought the next day. He apologized for his actions and said he was going through a tough time and needed the money. He begged me not to go to the police or tell them what was happening. He promised to return my phone and Yvonne offered to meet up and give me the money he had taken from my wallet. I was torn. On one hand, I wanted my phone back. But on the other, I didn't want to see the person who had stolen from me. I decided to take a friend with me for safety, and I agreed to meet Jack in a public place, without the police. When he arrived, I could see the remorse in his eyes. He handed me my phone, and the money he had taken, along with a handwritten apology letter. He explained that he had sold my phone to buy drugs, but he had since gotten clean, and tried to find the guy he sold the phone to, and paid double to get it back. I didn't know what to say, or how to feel. On one hand, I was grateful to have my phone back, but on the other, I couldn't believe that someone like this would actually be out there using Tinder. I thanked Jack for returning my phone, and wished him the best in his recovery. As I walked away, I couldn't help but think how easy it is to trust someone online. We often forget that there are real people behind those profiles, with their own struggles and flaws. But I also learned a valuable lesson about being cautious and protecting myself, especially when meeting someone from a dating app. I never thought that using Tinder would lead to such a traumatic experience, but I was grateful to have learned from it. As for Jack, I hope that he continues on the path to recovery and finds happiness and peace in his life. And as for me, I'll be more careful and mindful when it comes to trusting strangers on the internet. The police never found out about me meeting up with Jack. I let him off. I had the power. And I decided to do the right thing, in my opinion. As a busy professional in my mid-twenties, I found it increasingly difficult to meet new people and potential romantic partners. Between working long hours and spending most of my free time with friends and family, I felt like I was stuck in a dating rut. That's when I started using Tinder, a popular dating app that promised to make finding love as easy as swiping right. At first I was skeptical. How could I possibly find a meaningful connection on an app that seemed to revolve around superficial judgments based on a few carefully chosen photos? But after some convincing, I decided to give it a try, and thus began my journey down the rabbit hole of online dating. I remember the first time I downloaded the app. My heart was racing with excitement and nerves. 
I carefully selected my best photos, trying to strike a balance between looking attractive and not looking like an absolute slut who was trying too hard. I wrote a short and witty bio that I hoped would intrigue potential matches, and with a deep breath, I hit the publish button, making my profile public. The first few days on Tinder were a whirlwind. I was constantly checking my phone like an addict, eagerly swiping through profiles and messaging with anyone who caught my eye that I matched with. It was like a game, and I was determined to win. I went on a few dates with guys that I met through the app, some good and some not so good, but overall, I was enjoying the experience and the thrill of meeting new people. As time went on, I started to notice a pattern. Most of the guys I was matching with seemed to only be interested in one thing, hooking up. They would start off with seemingly innocent small talk, but it would quickly turn into overtly sexual connections. I was bombarded with messages from guys asking for pics or blatantly inviting me over for a Netflix and chill session. At first, I brushed it off as just a small percentage of guys on the app. But, as I continued to use Tinder, I realized that it was a common theme. It seemed like the majority of men on there were only looking for a casual hookup, not a real relationship. And while I had nothing against casual hookups, I was looking for something more meaningful. But what really grossed me out about Tinder was the blatant objectification of women. I couldn't go for a single day without receiving a message from a guy commenting on my appearance or making a sexual remark. It was as if they didn't see me as a person, but rather as a piece of meat to be judged and consumed. I also noticed that the profiles of many guys on the app were filled with derogatory and nasty comments in the bio. They would boast about what they had achieved, make crude jokes about women. It made me wonder how many of these men were actually decent human beings and how many were just looking to prey on vulnerable ladies. What really pushed me over the edge and made me delete the app for good was a particularly disturbing experience I had. I matched with a seemingly nice guy, and we had been chatting for a few days by this point. He seemed intelligent and respectful, and we had a lot in common, so when he asked me out on a date, I agreed. We met at a trendy bar downtown, and things were going well. We were laughing and getting to know each other, when suddenly, he leaned in and whispered in my ear, I can't wait to take you home and have my way with you. I was shocked and disgusted. I immediately got up and left the date, and after that, I deleted Tinder from my phone. That was the last straw for me. I couldn't take the constant objectification and blatant disrespects towards women anymore. I realized that Tinder was not the place to find genuine connection and meaningful relationships. It was a cesspool of superficial and blatant masculinity. I know that not everyone has had the same experience as me on Tinder. Some people have found love and happiness through the app, and I'm happy for them. But for me, it was a gross and disappointing experience. I realized that I would rather be single than subject myself to a toxic environment of online dating. In the end, I learned that real connections and relationships are not built on a few carefully chosen photos and witty bios. They're built through genuine interactions and getting to know someone on a deeper level. And for that, I will stick to meeting people in real life, in the real world, where I can see them as more than just a swipe on a screen.
I'd been single for what felt like forever and was starting to feel like I would never find love. That was until I matched with Amanda on Tinder. Right off the bat, I could be honest and genuine with this girl. I felt like I'd known her for years and there was something about her that just made me feel easy. We started talking, exchanging flirty messages, and laughing at each other's jokes. We decided to meet up for a date at a trendy rooftop bar in the city. I'd been on plenty of first dates before, but there was something different about Amanda. She was smart, funny, and incredibly beautiful. I couldn't wait to meet her in person. I spotted her at a corner table, looking even more stunning than she had ever looked in any of the photos. She was wearing a little tight black dress that hugged her curves perfectly. Under that, a pair of sky-high black heels. As I made my way towards her, I couldn't help but admire her confidence and prowess. Hi, I'm Amanda, she said with a smile as she stood up to greet me. Hi, I'm Sarah, I replied, trying my best to hide my nerves. We ordered drinks and got lost in conversation. It felt like we had known each other for years, and the chemistry between us was undeniable. As the night went on, we continued to laugh and flirt, and I was starting to feel like this could be something special. After a few hours, we decided to leave the bar and go for a walk around the city. As we strolled through the streets, Amanda suddenly stopped and yelled at me, Watch this! She took off her heels and ran down the sidewalk, her long hair flowing behind her. I couldn't help but laugh at her playfulness and spontaneity. But then, in an instant, everything changed as she landed on her foot awkwardly, on the curb that mounted down from the sidewalk, she let out a loud scream and suddenly collapsed to the ground onto the road. I rushed over to her, panic rising in my chest. What happened? Are you okay? I asked, trying to remain calm. I think I twisted my ankle. She groaned in pain. I helped her sit up, and as I looked at her foot, I could see that it was already starting to swell. I knew that we needed to get her to hospital, but I didn't want to leave her alone in time of need. I'll call an ambulance, I said, pulling out my phone. As I dialed 911, Amanda's pain seemed to intensify. She was screaming and crying, and I could feel her grip tightening on my arm. I tried to stay calm and reassure her that help was on the way, but her screams were getting louder, and I could feel my own anxiety rising through the roof. After what felt like an eternity, the ambulance arrived, and the medics quickly got to work. They put some weird cast and protection around Amanda's ankle, and lifted her onto a stretcher. I followed behind as they loaded her into the ambulance, still in shock at how quickly our perfect date had turned into a nightmare. Throughout the whole ordeal, Amanda was screaming in pain, and I could feel her grip on my hand getting tighter and tighter. I tried my best to comfort her, but there was nothing that I could do to ease her suffering. As we arrived at the hospital, the painkillers began to work. Her screaming and yells decided to die down. I stayed by Amanda's side as she was rushed into the emergency room. Her screams started to die down now, and I felt genuinely sad for her. Bringing her on this date had ended in such a bad way. After what felt like hours, the doctor finally came out to speak to me. He explained that Amanda had dislocated her ankle and would most likely need surgery to correct it. I felt a wave of relief knowing that she was going to be okay, but I also felt guilty for causing her so much pain. I sat in the waiting room for what felt like an eternity, my mind racing with thoughts of what had happened. 
I couldn't believe that a simple act of playfulness had turned into such a traumatic experience. Finally, Amanda was wheeled out of surgery and into one of the wards. I rushed to her side, and she opened her eyes and saw me. She let out a weak smile. I'm so sorry, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. It's not your fault, I replied, brushing a strand of hair out of her face. I just wanted to impress you, she continued, tears welling up in her eyes. You already did, I said, squeezing her hand reassuringly. Amanda stayed in the hospital for a few days, and I visited her every day, bringing her flowers and her favourite snacks. As we spent more time together, I realised that her injury had actually brought us closer. I saw a vulnerability in her that I hadn't seen before, and it made me fall even more deeply in love with her. Once she was released from hospital, I invited her to stay with me while she recovered. I genuinely wanted to take care of her and make sure she had everything that she needed, and as we spent more time together, our relationship blossomed. Amanda's injury had been a traumatic experience, but it also brought us closer together in a way that I could never imagine. We went from being two strangers on a first date to falling madly in love with each other, and as we sat on my couch snuggled up together, I couldn't help but feel grateful for that fateful night when Amanda tried to impress me by running in her heels and then taking them off and dislocating her ankle. It may not have gone as planned, but it led us to each other, and that was all that mattered. If you go on a date, and the guy doesn't turn up where he said he was going to be, and when he said he was going to be there, then take note, because it's a major red flag. A red flag that I just so happened to ignore six years ago. At the time, I was 19 years old, and I was fresh out of college. I hadn't been studying my grades, so, as a result, I ended up getting awful ones. By the time I had left college, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I was raised by a single mother, and I'd never met my dad. Well, I can't remember, but according to my grandma, I met him when I was one month old. I used to do a lot of work around my grandma's house odd chores, and she would give me pocket money. But as most of you know, pocket money isn't really going to help you survive, especially nowadays, but even back then, when inflation was just getting started. I hadn't really ever gone on dates, and although I'd had one boyfriend when I was in high school, I wouldn't really consider that anything serious. To me, that was just harmless, cute fun. You don't really have the same desires when you're 11 or 12 as you do when you're in your 18s, 19s and 20s. I don't know what it is, but there's something so sweet and innocent about having a girlfriend or a boyfriend at high school, or, let alone that, I even hear stories of my friends' kids having kids as their boyfriend and girlfriend in kindergarten. I didn't really exactly know where to start looking, as to be honest, my mum told me that that should have been the last thing on my mind. What needed to happen first was me to get an income and a life of my own. I was torn between going back to college, studying a separate course to get grades in order to go into something to do with culinary. 
I didn't really know what I wanted to do, and I didn't like the idea of being a chef, but my mum somehow thought that was a good idea. Whilst I was still doing chores for my grandma, she recommended that I get a job down at the local store. We live in a small town, with a population of only around five to 10,000 people. I consider that small, especially when we're talking in terms of America. A lot of people didn't really know each other. It's not like your typical story of a small town, where everyone waves at everyone, everyone says hey, and everyone knows each other's names. It couldn't be further from the truth. I kept my head down and avoided all guys, but I listened to my grandma and decided that I was going to apply for that job. Sure enough, I ended up getting the job, which to me was a big surprise. I don't know why, because it's not exactly a success or a massive achievement, but to me back then, it did seem it. Let's be real, I wasn't expecting to get it, and I felt that I was now some president of America. Still at this point, I hadn't gone on a date with any guy, and I was really starting to get needy. I know that sounds wrong and weird, but I promised that I'd be 100% honest when I write this story. So, here goes. I wanted to catch feelings for a guy. I wanted to experience intimate touch, relationship, and emotions. And just spending every night in my bedroom, scrolling on my phone, or doing FaceTime calls with my friends, it just didn't feel the same. The same as what, you might ask? Well, whatever I thought it would be like to have a boyfriend that I could fall madly in love with. Obviously, we've all watched things online. We all have our fantasies. We all have stories and ideas and preferences. But although I'd seen some of these things, and I was part of some pretty questionable Reddit groups and Twitter communities, I still didn't really know what I wanted. Obviously, the cliche terms, tall, dark, and handsome, would have been nice. But in the real world, I know there are a lot more things to a guy than simply his height, hair color, and his eyes. Going from spending most of my time at college, to then just being in my bedroom for a whole four months straight, was very boring. So when I started my first shift at the store, I was like some kind of a sweetie girl in a sweet shop. Imagine a girl who's addicted to candy, which is most girls, and then imagine her in the best candy shop ever. I don't know what it was, but during my shift, only hot guys would ever walk through the door. Obviously, I'm just exaggerating here, but that's how my mind saw it. A lot of the times, I had no confidence to talk to the guys, as I guess psychologically, or biologically, I just assumed that they would make the first move, if they truly liked me, that was. But I didn't have any confidence. I've been told I'm not a relatively ugly girl, but I don't know. Whilst I was doing my job one time, I came across a couple of guys who started to ask for my number. I was flattered, but at the same time, I felt worried. For some reason, when the first guy asked me for my number, all of a sudden panic set in. A situation where I should actually feel happy and flattered, I started to feel scared, as if giving out my number would somehow be giving out a piece of me, a piece of my private life, and possible information that could get me in trouble. I made stupid mistakes. I rejected guys who I clearly was attracted to, and saw almost on a daily basis while working that job. I started to get very embarrassed, so I handed in my notice, and quit. To this day, I still regret doing this, badly. But there's one more thing that I also regret doing. I realized that I had fucked up. Not only had I gone and quit a job that was so easy and paying pretty decent for what it was, but I also rejected opportunities to have the very thing which I wanted the most. A boyfriend, a husband, a companion, and a lover. 
Out of anger, I decided to react by downloading every dating app I could find on my phone. I started going crazy, putting up all my photos, spending hours on all the sections, and eventually, once I had no job, I just turned into a dating app absolute lunatic. I became addicted to talking to guys, getting their numbers, and trying to arrange dates. I guess this was my way of trying to put right what I had done wrong. I prayed that I would come across that cute guy that asked for my number in the store, but he clearly wasn't on any of the apps, and unfortunately, I couldn't find him on any of them. I used Tinder most of the time, as that was the one that had the most people on it. At first, I didn't really meet up with anyone, however, finally, after around a few weeks of using it, I still had no job, and still spent most of my time in my bedroom. I think my mum had given up on me. I told her that I quit my job because I had a panic attack. She went down and had a chat with the owner, who said that that wasn't the case. So, she realised that I was lying. My grandma wasn't happy at all either, as she was the one that found out about the job. She used to walk down there almost every day, until her legs started to get really bad. The guy who I was going on a date with was named Miles, and to me this was all that mattered now. My mom and grandma were really annoyed that I had quit this job. When they sat me down and asked me why, I ended up saying that I didn't like the people who worked there, which again was another massive lie that I extremely regret. Going on my date with Miles was going to be my new life purpose, and let's just say God taught me a life lesson. When I went on the date, I had to walk around two miles into town. I did this at 11pm by the time my mum was already asleep in bed. My mum works as a nurse and wakes up at around 4.30 in the morning to go in and start her shift. I knew that if I waited until at least past 10.30, she would be asleep by that time, and I could just leave. If I tried to go out that evening while she was still awake, and told her, there's no doubt she would be investigative, and try and find out exactly where I was going, and with who. I've explained what type of girl I was back then, and you know, I never went out, and spent all day every day, in my bedroom, until I got the job, that I quit. I came out of my bedroom quietly, dressed nicely, with my favourite perfume on. I opened the door as quietly as I could, but the hinges are old and rusted, so a creaking noise echoes throughout the house. I listened out for a moment, wondering if mum was still awake. She wasn't, so I made my way out into the corridor, and straight out the front door. Our house only has one floor, there's no upstairs, it's a small two bedroom house, my family are poor. When I got out onto the driveway, I made my way down onto the sidewalk, and started the 40 odd minute walk to get to town. What were we going to do there? Go for a drive in his car? What the fuck was I doing? Being completely manipulated, into not using my brain. Once I had walked for 40 minutes, I was hot, flustered, and a little sweaty. My perfume was already starting to wear off, and I was starting to have second thoughts as to what the fuck I was actually doing. We were agreeing to meet just outside of one of the cinemas. It wasn't open, obviously. It was a Sunday night, and at this point, it was around 20 to 30 minutes past 11. There were still people in town, obviously it's not crazy late, but it was a lot more quieter than it was when I used to work in this area. The shop I was working at, I walked past, it was open when I walked past it, but they shut at 11pm, so no one would be there now. That's important for reference sake later on in this story. I waited and waited for Miles to arrive. When I met him on Tinder, we'd immediately started talking through text. 
He sent me photos of his car. It was a pretty nice Mercedes, shiny, looked new, and he even sent me a video of how it sounds. I'm not a car girl, so I don't really know much about cars, but I think he got the wrong impression that I somehow did know about them. I was just trying to be sweet and polite. I knew that I would at least hear his car, even if it was within a few hundred meters, but as I stood there, still waiting for him, I decided that I was going to text him. That's when he told me that he was waiting for me and couldn't see me anywhere. I got confused and text back saying, where are you? Question mark. He replied saying that he was outside one of the stores, a store where they do nails and acrylics. I knew exactly where that was and it was another five or 10 minutes walk further into town. I told him that we had agreed to meet outside where I was, and I even sent him screenshot proof of him telling me to meet him there. He said that he made a mistake, and that I needed to now walk to this nail-slash-acrylic shop, which also obviously wasn't open. I simply brushed it off as him making a mistake, and started the 5-10 to ten minute walk to follow him even further into the town. Once I had finished the walk, I was expecting him to be waiting outside, or at least parked up on the sidewalk with his Mercedes, but when I got to the nails and acrylics place, it was silent. I had only seen a few cars drive by on my walk there, and outside of it, there wasn't a single soul. I thought that maybe he had left, or gone to something like a event, but I decided to wait outside and text him again. This time I sent him a photo, a selfie of me, with the poster slash logo of the acrylics place behind me. He sent back in a laughing emoji, and then just said, wait, I'll be there soon. I waited and waited. 10 minutes turned into 20 minutes, 30 minutes turned into a whole hour. It was now well gone midnight, I had no idea what I was doing, and I'd had my fair share of weird looks from people driving by in their cars. I started to think that maybe to them, I looked like I was a working girl. We had none of that around our town, as it was a high income town, and if anyone did try it, they'd most likely be shooed out of town. After the hour was up, I decided that I was going to give him a call. He didn't answer his phone, but just kept texting me saying, Hey, I'm on the way please wait. I messaged him back saying, Miles, I've been here for one hour. It's so late now. I have to walk another 40 minutes just to get home. I'm done. Sorry. Bye. He replied by saying that he would take me home, but there was no sign of him, and I waited another few minutes and bit my tongue. Enough was enough. This guy was a fucking loser. He'd let me down and I don't care what was happening in his life. He'd wasted two hours of mine, so that was it. I made the walk home. It was a long way, and by the time I made it home, it was probably around 1.30 in the morning. I walked slow and spent most of the time on my phone. I didn't really think for a second that Miles would drive up behind me. He didn't. Well, that's not until I made it to the house which was the scary part. It turns out that he had been following me. I don't know how, but I clearly didn't notice. As I walked up to my mum's house and opened the door, I heard a car pull up behind me. As I turned around, sure enough, I recognised the Mercedes. It was Miles. My heart sank as I realised that he had now followed me home and knew exactly where I lived. I didn't say hi, I didn't wave, and I didn't walk towards his car. Instead, I got the worst stalker vibes ever, and felt like I was about to be kidnapped. I turned around, backed my body into the house, and slammed the door shut. I'm guessing that would have woken mum up, and it clearly did. I locked the door behind myself, quickly ran to my bedroom, slammed the door shut to change out of my dress clothes. I didn't want my mum finding out exactly what I had done or planned for. It took me no more than one minute to change all my clothes and then get into my pajamas. Then, I ran out. 
I could hear my mum was awake, and she started saying, What was that? Did you hear that? I come out of my bedroom, mess my hair up, and pretend to look like I've been asleep. At this point, I was expecting to see Miles just gone. There's no way his car's still outside, is there? I thought to myself. As I walk closer to the bedroom window, I look out, and he's still there. His Mercedes is still just running at the end of the drive. His engine's on, and so are his lights. Mum notices his car, but keeps asking me about why the door was slammed. What was that noise? Did that wake you up? Was it you? I pretended that it woke me up too. Mum didn't realise that I had put the key into the door wrong. On the key fob, there are over seven pairs of keys. Some for the garage, some spare for each door, a back door, a front door, her car key, and a bunch of other stuff. I put the garage key wedged into the front door. It didn't fit, so it was hanging on from the tip. Well, she didn't notice, thank God. I quickly changed it, and then tried to change topic by saying that there was a weird car at the end of our drive. She did notice that too, and we started looking out the window, wondering who it was and what they were doing. Yeah, I knew exactly who it was, but I didn't know exactly what he was doing. I decided to text Miles. I said, go away, or we'll call the police. When I sent him that text, his engine died. I don't know if he turned it off or it broke down, but I no longer heard the engine. Instead, I see the door of the car open, and Miles steps out. He then starts walking towards the house, and my mum starts to panic. Who's this? I can't answer the door. I'm in my nightdress. I'm in my nightdress, you'll have to answer, you'll have to answer. Mum, we don't know who this is. Don't answer the door to random strangers, I told her, knowing full well that this was all my fault. Me and my mum ran to the back of the house and ignored all the knocks and rings of the doorbell that Miles did. Leave now, I sent in all capitals, with exclamation marks, five of them, afterwards. Eventually, he stopped knocking and ringing. I hear his car start back up, and the noisy exhaust take off down the neighbourhood street. That was a close call. I don't know how the guy followed me back. He must have found out where I live by just slowly following behind. The walk's two whole miles, and it's not all on the same road, so I have no idea how he would have known where to look for me. Clearly, he was just toying with me, like I was a deer and he was a lion. That creeped me out. I blocked the guy on everything, and I realized that I should probably not trust meeting guys, and just reading them out of nowhere. Hey guys, thank you for listening to tonight's horror stories. If you enjoyed them and you're new to this channel, please click subscribe and join us for future uploads. I try and upload every single night here on this channel. It's quite difficult because I don't have a team of editors, I don't have a team of a YouTube network or corporation. This channel is run by me and I'm currently in my bedroom with a $100 microphone and my laptop that doesn't really work properly. But, <laughs> so guys, if you did enjoy it, please leave a like, please subscribe, and also comment down below your opinions. I see all of my loyal returning subscribers, and I do recognize a lot of your names. I might do a giveaway in the future, I think, um, to kind of give back to you guys, because uh, it really does make me uh, feel warm in my heart when I see some of the comments from you guys. But, on another note, I just wanted to say that uh, if you can uh, have any way of sharing my videos, please do. Share them with your friends, family, share them to Facebook groups, Reddit forums, to group chats on WhatsApp or any other communities you're part of. 
um, that would mean a lot to me because I work very hard on this channel and I'm an independent content creator. I'm not linked to any company or corporation that promotes my videos with advertisements and uh, I don't use AI. I know I've been through this a lot of you guys at the end. I don't mean to kill the vibes with the stories and bang on about AI, but it is very important. I do see it taking over YouTube. It's it's done the same on TikTok. Uh, now you just have all robot videos and voices all over TikTok. And I feel like it kills the creativity of the human spirit and soul. And it's uh, just a way that lazy people try and earn money. Now there's a lot of AI channels on YouTube that do horror stories. And if there's one thing I could ask you to do in this time we've met is please only listen to real human horror story channels then you can kind of know for a fact that you're listening to a real business a family business or an individual you're not listening to a millionaire's channel who owns 20,000 channels and runs ai automation channels so it's just really important because otherwise what happens is the smaller channels and i know i have a lot of subscribers and i get pretty decent views but on top of that, eventually the small guys just disappear because they become uh, kind of like kicked out the niche. So it's important that you guys make responsible decisions in who you listen to because it's the same as where you spend your money. You know, it's like a vote. Very important. So I really do appreciate you guys listening to my stories and, uh, you know, spending the night here. And I'll continue to bring them. If you have any recommendations of types of stories you'd like me to cover and look for and do research on, then I will be more than happy to do that. We've got Airbnb, Tinder, Home Alone, Craigslist, Trucker, Park Ranger, uh, Scary Night, Storm Night, Camping, Creepy Neighbor. There are so many. There's, there's you know, there's thousands. Um, I tend to stick to the same five or ten. But I was thinking of branching out. But I only want to branch out into what you guys want. Otherwise, you know, it won't perform as well. And you guys just won't want to listen. So, always comment down below any criticism you have for me or the stories. And, uh, yeah. Hope you're all well. And I'll catch you in tomorrow evening's video.